As Britain withdraws troops and prepares to hand over control of Basra, militias are battling British forces and each other for power. Gunmen rule the streets. Tell them it's dangerous here. Tell them it's dangerous. Iraqi interpreters who for four years have worked shoulder to shoulder with British troops, the creme de la creme of the brave new Iraq, are branded collaborators and legitimate targets. Scores of them are now on the run. Indelibly tainted, they're being hunted down, shot or beheaded, accused of betraying their country. Now the interpreters feel betrayed by the British. They should help us. They should. Well, as an obligation? As an obligation. They are obligated to us. They said that they came to help us. What kind of help are they giving me now? They say they would protect us. What kind of protection are they giving me now? They say they came to give me freedom. I lost everything. They are obligated. I've got a whole clutch of documents here. Some of them are photographs. Some of them are official letters, letters from the British Army, all of which have left me in no doubt that this woman is who she says she is, a former interpreter with the British Army in southern Iraq. She's fled, but her family remains in Iraq. For that reason, we can't use her name, show her face, or even say in which city we met her. We cannot even tell the story she tearfully told me, in case they identify her. She never thought it would come to this. I wanted to help my country. I wanted to help my people. I believed that we would have democracy. We will have freedom. I was so happy, so excited. New country, new life, new freedom. Uh, we're just coming around today, just say hello to everybody as I've already explained. In the beginning, interpreters worked openly with the British. They believed in the new Iraq. Now we've had to conceal their identities. Since the invasion, they've run the gauntlet with the soldiers they shadow. Roadside bombs, ambushes, raids and patrols. Their cultural advisors, the army's eyes and ears. And their translators. Now, they're scattered across the Middle East, unable to go home, unable to stay. We know of many, but we've spoken to four. These former interpreters are not paranoid, no delusions here. Their fear is real. Forced to live under the radar in foreign countries, terrified of deportation. I tried to reassure those whom I met. I promised anonymity. You'll just have to trust me, I said. One replied, we trusted your government but they agreed to meet. We're in another Arab capital. Once again, we can't say which one because we're trying to protect the identity of yet more interpreters who fled Iraq. Three this time, and once again, they've come loaded with letters of commendation, testimonials, um, certificates of service, and, and they make interesting reading. This one names the man who uh, the, the commanding officer says has put himself in considerable danger to do all of this. This is listing all the stuff he did on patrols. Not only did he take the, time, take the same risks as me and my men whilst on patrol, but he was also working in an atmosphere of intimidation and fear. It's widely known that interpreters working for the British were considered legitimate targets by some terrorists, and other interpreters working from the logistics base were murdered during the time that he worked for me. One of the men I met had narrowly escaped execution last month. Yeah. I'm late my job and they are kidnapped me. They, Al -Mahdi militia. You, the, the Mahdi militia kidnapped you on the, way, on the way for home from the base? Yeah. What actually happened? At 8 o'clock, 8 p.m. Uh, and then they tortured me because I work with the British Army. What did they do? Uh, kick me and uh, to give them a name of interpreters' locations. So they interrogated you, asking you the names of other interpreters that uh -huh. you worked with uh -huh. and where they lived? Uh -huh. Exactly. Mohammed was tracked down by Iraqi intelligence and rescued by the Iraqi army. This, a detailed account of his abduction, filed with the criminal division of the Basra police. He'd been held for three days. He fled the country almost immediately. Did, did you know any interpreters who were killed? Because I understand that quite a few have been killed. And yeah. there was one incident last year in which, am I right in saying that 17 people Yeah, 17 died? interpreters, they've been killed. 
and uh, uh, Basra Academy. They are working with the Basra Academy as trainer. They killed 17 interpreters in one minute. The Ministry of Defence has denied that the 17 killed were interpreters or employees of British forces, but these men knew them and insist that they were translators and employed by the British. Do you feel that the, that the British offered you enough protection in your jobs as interpreters? No, they don't protect us. It's very dangerous. The situation is very dangerous, for the, especially for the interpreters working in Basra. Yeah, and there is not, not any, any kind of protection from, from the MOD to the interpreters. That's why we left. Were you directly threatened? Yeah, I've got two, uh, two types of th threaten. Um, I got a text message on my phone and one of the persons working with the militia threatened me. He told me if you don't stop to cooperate with the British forces, so we will cut your head and we will throw your, your body in the rubbish. What do you feel like when, a, when another Iraqi says to you, if I see you, I will kill you? Do you, do, do you feel like you're a traitor? Yeah. The British government is aware of the plight of the three men I talked to. The Home Office has suggested they register with the UN Refugee Agency, whose offices in neighbouring countries have been swamped by Iraqi refugees. The interpreters had appealed to Tony Blair not to abandon them. The Home Office responded by saying, regarding the feasibility of possibly resettling some very vulnerable displaced Iraqis, discussions are at an early stage. The words floodgate and opening etched into the subtext. We've concealed your identities. We've changed your names. We're not going to say which country we're talking to you in, but it's an Arab country. Yeah. Do you feel safe here? No. Why not? Because, you know, even here, the militia, they got offices, they got men working for them looking for bathies and interpreters as well. So you feel as if you could actually be targeted even in exile? Yeah. That's why I'm scared. You're scared? Yeah. The Arabic word for collaborator is Amil, literally agent. Last November, the British Army spokesman in Basra said there was no evidence that interpreters were being systematically targeted. The Ministry of Defence was unable to tell Channel 4 News how many interpreters had been killed. Threats had been made to British Army employees, just as threats had been made to ordinary Iraqi civilians, it said. The MOD declined to answer questions regarding contractual obligations to local employees. It insisted they were given regular security briefings to allow them to make informed decisions about personal security. We've learned that as far back as 2003, senior British staff officers in Basra were made aware that interpreters were likely targets, but other than these security briefings, nothing was done. A former soldier we talked to, who'd hired and worked with interpreters in southern Iraq, has also chosen to conceal his identity. There were certainly specific warnings that this could happen, dating back to the summer of 2003. And I know of a number of people that aired concerns that interpreters were being put into positions which were uh, putting their own lives at risk and that of their associates and their families. Thousands of local Iraqis got jobs with the British in Basra, drivers, cleaners and cooks. But interpreters were the brightest and best. A lot of them young graduates, trusting and full of hope for the future. Four years on, with Iraq and their dreams turned upside down, Many are now on the run, dumped by the very people they'd trusted and had wanted so much to help.